everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and I am really, really happy and relieved to be coming at you with a reading wrap-up. Why? Because I haven't done one of these. It's been at least eight weeks. I think it's been more like three months, and that's because I fell into a massive <laughs> reading slump during self-isolation. I did that whole self-isolation TBR, and then I, I went like four to six weeks where it was almost impossible for me to read or finish a book. So this reading wrap-up is a long time coming, but I finally broke the slump partway through this and finished a bunch of books, and I'm really excited to talk about them. This is a slightly strange mix of some thrillers, light suspense reads, and really morbid, harrowing non-fiction. So strap in, it's gonna be a funny one. So the first book is Who Did You Tell by Leslie Cara. So Leslie Cara also wrote The Rumor, which I read last year. It's one that I liked quite a bit. I had some quibbles with it that mostly had to do with essentially what was lost in translation. It was a British book that for some reason was literally translated for the US. They changed the setting to be US, but didn't quite satisfactorily change all the Britishisms in it. Long story short, this book is set in Britain and everyone's British and all is right with the world. Though interestingly, I ended up giving this a solid four stars in part because I would really call this women's fiction with light suspense. It really doesn't feel or read like a thriller. And when I got to the very end to the author's acknowledgments, she said that this was actually the first book she wrote, but the rumor was sold and published first. And I was like, oh, this explains a lot about this book. In some ways, it definitely feels like a step backwards if you did read and enjoy the rumor. The rumor is a lot more fast paced. This one isn't. How However, as I said, if you're a fan of character-driven women's fiction where there is very high-stakes suspense, this one really hits the spot. It's about a recovering alcoholic who has had to move home to live with her mother in this small beachside town, and she's going to AA meetings, and she meets a new guy, and the undercurrent of suspense for a large part of it is she doesn't want to tell him that she is a recovering alcoholic because she thinks that he will hate her and break up with her. He won't want the baggage of her being a recently recovered alcoholic. And also she has some secrets from the past. Her ex-boyfriend died because of her and someone has been sending her threatening notes, basically saying, you deserve to die. So it's kind of that cocktail of the relationship based, oh, I can't lose him and wait, but someone's stalking me and threatening to kill me. And of course, all of this comes together in the end. It has a very pulse-pounding, exciting, high-stakes third act, but it's a slow burner otherwise. I read the first 30 to 40 percent and wasn't entirely sure what the main thrust of the novel was because it takes its time setting up characters and specifically the romantic relationship. So this one is going to work for you if you like that kind of fiction. I will say if Recovering Alcoholic isn't your bag, it is full of a ton of kind of that self-loathing and kind of the addiction mindset. It added some very interesting texture to the story. It's usually not my go-to, however, and I can see it rubbing some readers the wrong way. However, I ended up really caring about everyone, and like I said, really stellar third act where I was on the edge of my seat. I really cared about what was happening to the main character, and she gets into some really bad, bad stuff. And I had no clue how she was going to get out of it. Anyway, I gave it four stars. It's Who Did You Tell by Leslie Cara. And then I fell into a reading slump. And what did I read to try to get me out of the reading slump? Voices from Chernobyl. I went into a slightly morbid phase. You can tell this was the beginning of self-isolation, but it's exactly what I wanted to read. And Voices from Chernobyl is by Svetlana Alexievich, and it is a oral history of 
people from Chernobyl. She has this incredible style where she just, she interviewed all of these people and she doesn't do editorializing or anything. You get transcripts of exactly what these people recounted to the author. But of course she's done editorializing in the sense that she's arranged them in a certain order. Each one has like a, a headline so you kind of have an idea of what you're going to get from the chapter. And they're arranged in a very purposeful order so that they build on each each other. It is upsetting, it is harrowing, it's eye-opening. I've always been really fascinated by Soviet history and I know a fair deal about East Germany, so the DDR, the De Deutsche Demokratische Republik, and a lot of the kind of zeitgeist and like mentality of that area and time and I got echoes of that in this because so much of it is is talking about the Soviet Union, not just Chernobyl, about the mentality of the people about before and after. It's a really beautiful read. I definitely want to read more by this author. Gave it five stars if that isn't already clear. She's done a ton of these kind of oral histories on different topics of the Soviet Union and Russia and whatnot, and I really want to read more. If you are interested in Chernobyl, if you're fascinated by Chernobyl, and if you watched the miniseries Chernobyl on HBO, the screenwriter heavily borrowed, with permission of course, from this book. Several of the characters in this book, who are real people, you will find in the miniseries, and they were pulled from Voices from Chernobyl, so I highly recommend it if you're in that kind of mood. And I was, and I propelled forward by reading more depressing nonfiction, but I found that it's what I wanted to read, and I was just trying to read at all to push through this reading slump, and I'll talk about the book that really broke my reading slump in a minute, but first I read I'll Be Gone in the Dark by Michelle McNamara. So this one had been on my TBR for literally years, and I actually realized when I was like, oh, I'm finally gonna read that, because I got it for like $3.99 on Kindle sale, that I'd actually read the sample from Kindle years ago. And there was imagery from those first few chapters that has stuck in my brain for a few years and I couldn't remember what it was from. And that gives you a really good snapshot of Michelle McNamara's writing. It is vivid. <laughs> she has this amazing way of scene setting and mood setting and it gets dark and it gets creepy. It's a book about the Golden State Killer. That's what we call him now because Michelle McNamara coined the term. She was an amateur detective basically. She got into this on forums and whatnot and decided to research this guy and write a book about it and became one of the foremost experts on the Golden State Killer who had different names in different places including the original Night Stalker down here in Southern California. And tragically she died prematurely in her sleep in 2016 before she could finish this book. So you can't talk about this book without talking about the author. And the book is part personal memoir. She talks about why she personally got involved in this. It has to do with a woman who was murdered in her neighborhood when she was a young girl and some of her own kind of interests and background. And she weaves it in nicely. I have seen some readers don't like the personal stuff. I do. And I also think that had she been able to complete the book, it all would have come together probably better than it does. But it's not her fault or the book's fault that it can't. We have a horrible situation where the author died before the book could be finished. So 80% of this book was five stars for me. I was sucked in. I was constantly Googling. That's the other thing that sucks. After she died, they caught the guy. So you're reading the book that was written years ago and it has all these suppositions and like key facts and like theorizing. And we know now who actually did it. And I was looking up to try and see what was true about him versus what wasn't. And so what I'm really looking forward is to some kind of definitive account, a book or documentary. There is a documentary based on this coming out that compares and contrasts Michelle McNamara's research to the true facts. But we still don't know much about the real person. But regardless, this is a true crime thing that I got really sucked into. 80% of the book, five stars. Michelle McNamara was insanely talented. And then unfortunately, you get to the part where she had stopped writing the book. And her research assistant and another journalist do their best to finish the book. The finish is fine. Like the literal finish, the last like two pages are pitch perfect. They, they, it happens that Michelle McNamara wrote like a letter to the killer and it ends the book beautifully. But before that, it's tricky. It's a book that tries to basically tie up loose ends, 
but ultimately the research was never finished and the writing was never finished by the author. So it landed on a four stars for me because it's an uneven book and it's not that book's fault. If you like true crime and you like vivid, creative nonfiction writing, Michelle McNamara was one of the best and she was taken too soon and it's so sad. I would have loved to have seen what her writing career became. Um, beautiful example of narrative nonfiction and if you like true crime, I do recommend checking it out. Just be prepared for a slightly uneven reading experience. Now for the book that broke my reading slump. I was at this point where the nonfiction was really good and was nourishing my soul in a specific way, but I wasn't reading at the volume I wanted and I had an insane TBR of thrillers that I legitimately wanted to read and still want to read. So I decided to be strategic. I was like, I got approved for the new Riley Sager and the new Sarah Alderson. Both of those are auto buy authors for me and I bet you I can burn through their books in 48 hours or less. And yes, that's what I did. That's how I broke my reading slump. So first I read Home Before Dark by Riley Sager. So this is his new one. It is coming out at the end of June and it's basically The Haunting of Hill House, but it's not. I say that as a compliment. If you liked The Haunting of Hill House, if you like the creepy old house that a family moves into, something horrible happens, they flee. And 25 years later, it's a daughter trying to piece together fragments of memory from a childhood about a parent who is now deceased who wrote a book that in her view ruined her life. So it has some of the ingredients of Hill House, the family who fled the haunted house and someone wrote a book about it, but it otherwise is quite different. It is a gothic haunted house thriller book. I will say ultimately it is my least favorite Riley Sager, but it's the kind of thing where it's like they're all so freaking good that what does that scale even mean? It's kind of like when I don't particularly love a Ruth Ware, she's still Ruth Ware. So it doesn't really mean anything. It's all about whether this particular flavor of thriller works for you. Probably the thing for this one for me is that I felt a little less close to the main character Maggie than I have to some of the past Riley Sager heroines. But in terms of like guessing and wanting to know what really happened, I was definitely kept on the edge of my seat. A big part of that honestly was reading to try to get ahead of the narrative and figure out how it was going to be different from Hill House. And it went in a completely different direction and one that I ultimately think is pretty satisfying. Worth noting something that Home Before Dark does that I love in books, literally put it in things I love in books video, and that is book within a book. Not many books do this. And this one does, and it's incredibly well done. You alternate between Maggie in the now, going back to this house after her father has died, trying to fix it up in order to sell it, and the forward moving narrative from his best selling haunted house book about the house. So you move forward in his book, getting all the details of the haunting, but it's contrasted with things happening to Maggie right now. And another thing it did that I personally enjoyed, the book makes it kind of clear that his book wasn't very good, that he ultimately wasn't a great writer and it's kind of a hokey haunted house book. And I kind of love an author who can take that tack and poke fun at their own genre because you basically go between Maggie's chapters, which read like a Riley Sager book, which is good, and the father's chapters of the book that he wrote, which is just kind of like hokey, cheap fiction. And I, I laughed so many times at like the cheesy cliffhangers from the dad's book. And it added a level of enjoyment uh, to the book for me because th this is a trope that I really enjoy. So I do recommend Home Before Dark to those who like high concept gothic-esque thrillers, the kind where you're going, wait, is there a supernatural explanation? Or can you explain it with X? And you kind of have this, these lingering questions. I love books like that. So if that is your kind of read, definitely pick up Home Before Dark by Riley Sager. Next, I read another auto by author for me, Sarah Alderson. Her new one is called The Weekend Away. Previously, I loved and read In Her Eyes and Friends Like These. And The Weekend Away reminded me more of Friends Like These, which is my favorite of the two, though generally she's a five star author for me. And I gave this one a five stars as well. This one is the trope of the girls who go away for a girl's weekend. Things get 
really crazy, her friend disappears and it propels her on a journey. No one believes her that something's happened to her friend, so she has to run around Portugal desperately trying to figure out what happened to her friend. But also, of course, her friend had secrets things that she was keeping from the main character, things that make the main character look guilty when they do finally find some evidence of foul play. And it builds and it builds and it builds and it gets really, really twisted, really juicy interpersonal drama type stuff, which is why I love friends like these a lot as well, with a last page twist that kind of punched me in the gut. I stopped, went back a few pages and read it again. And when I realized what the ending was doing, it took my, I was just like breath out of my lungs. I was like, oh no, it's got a nice gut punch ending and plenty of twists. So if you like soapy thrillers where it's like something bad happens on vacation, it has that fish out of water aspect, but also like, are, is my closest friend lying to me kind of thing. You'll definitely enjoy The Weekend Away. It was a page turner for me. I flew through it and it has stuck with me, especially the last page, but also just some of the characterization stuff I really appreciated. So my slump broken, I went right into The Herd by Andrea Bartz. I decided I wanted to read more rich ladies behaving badly fiction and this one really hit the spot. It is about women who run a startup in New York. It's basically like a female only co-working space with an enigmatic founder, Eleanor, and it's tool POV between two sisters, one who went to college with the founder and is one of her best friends and does PR for the company. And the other is her little sister, who's also friends with the group. There's lots of complicated dynamic things where the older sister introduced the younger sister to her friends at Harvard. And she kind of took over them as her friend group because she moved to New York and the older sister didn't. And there's all of these kind of family dynamic layers of the older sister is adopted and has serious conflicts with her mother that the younger sister doesn't have. So you get kind of the dual POV tension of two sisters who love each other, but have a lot of drama between them. And in the midst of this, their mutual friend, Eleanor, goes missing. Older sister might have some clues as to some shady things that her friend was into. And younger sister has her career and her future writing on writing a tell-all book about Eleanor, the founder. But the fact that she was doing that makes her suspicious in her disappearance as well. I feel like I've done a horrible job of describing this book, except to say that it was, you know, high flying, smart, rich women in Manhattan in a cutthroat world and stuff definitely goes down. It's got some hints of like small town secrets. Like there's definitely stuff in the past that comes up. There's people who aren't who they seem to be. There's the sister dynamics, as I mentioned. But ultimately, it's a very feminist book. All of this is done in a self-aware way. And I love it when there are complicated dynamics between women that are self-aware, that actually have something to say about women and kind of competitive relationships, especially in the business world. I had some tiny quibbles about one or two of the implications of some of the twists as it relates to class, but really nothing that was a deal breaker for me. I went into this just wanting kind of a soapy elites of New York thriller read, and that's exactly what it delivers. So if that's the kind of subgenre thriller you like, uh, that I definitely like, I think you should check out The Herd by Andrea Bartz. I found it to be a really good read, and I'm also kind of like, why is there not this like women's club co-working space? It's such a good business idea. So next on my very lucky, awesome, breaking the reading slump read streak, I read One by One by Ruth Ware. <sighs> okay, guys, this one, it's like it was made for me. It's like Ruth Ware like knew what I love in books and wrote one just for me. I can't even tell you all of the tropes of it because spoilers, but let's just say if you watched my things I love in books and my favorite and least favorite thriller tropes videos, that several of them are in this book. Uh, the one I can tell you about because it is the premise of the book and the reason I was so excited to pick it up. It's an isolation thriller. It is about the team for a app startup, a music app startup, who are having a shareholders meeting at a swanky ski chalet in the French Alps. 
Of course, there is the buildup of the skiing and oh, how isolated it is and oh, let's hope nothing bad happens. Then one of the co-founders goes missing on the slopes. Then there's an avalanche. There's Snowden at the chalet. They realize something bad must have happened to Ava. And then people start dying. Oh, I love these kind of things. It has a real Agatha Christie vibe. It has a, a real and then there were none vibe, which is probably why this book is called One by One. The book is dual POV between an insider and an outsider. Your insider character used to work for the company and is at this meeting as a shareholder. So she kind of knows all the characters involved in the company. And of course, because it's a juicy, juicy thriller, almost everyone who works for the company is kind of a terrible person. So you're basically on murder watch. Who's gonna die next and who of the terrible people did it? But then it's contrasted with an outsider perspective, who is Erin, who works for the ski chalet. She's basically the activities director. Before everyone comes, she cleans the house and while they're there, she takes them out onto the ski slopes and makes sure that everyone is having a good time. And so she ends up trapped in the ski chalet with all these people from this company who she can tell are kind of terrible people. So you go back and forth between Liz, who has different interactions with her colleagues, and Erin, who overhears things and kind of inserts herself. And it's a who done it? Who there is the murderer? It all goes down in the third act. This book was intense. I was really into the mechanics of the business. It's this weird app where like you can snoop. It's called snoop snoop on people's music choices. It's like Spotify, but with stalking kind of. And it touches on kind of things like tech permissions and spying on people and kind of business ethics. And of course that they're young and hip and work for this startup and it's a collection of beautiful, slightly horrible people. Liz is the kind of gawky outsider who regardless owes a lot to the company's founder for kind of making her career. And Erin who has a dark past kind of like, you know that she suffered a tragedy and that is why she is kind of working at this job. And I really liked the tension and pull between Liz, who I definitely related to kind of her outsider feeling in this hip young company and really not wanting to be at this retreat from hell and Aaron, the outsider, trying to figure everyone out. The two POVs were really effective for building the tension, especially because I think if you spent the entire book in Liz's POV, she is a classic anxious Ware heroine if you've read other Ruth Ware books. And Liz is a lot. She's probably the most a lot of any Ruth Ware heroine. And when I started reading in her POV, I was like, oh, this is a lot. And then thankfully Erin was there to temper the read. So I really liked that dual POV aspect of it. And as I hinted, it does other tropes that I really, really like in thrillers. And I have to say it executed them pretty well, which is why I like them. And I did give this book five stars. So we're getting into the territory with Ruth Ware, where I love all of her books. And it's almost like I need like a rating system within the five stars to differentiate them. And I feel like ultimately, in a Dark Dark Wood remains probably my favorite Ruth Ware. It's not even that it's like the most expertly executed. It just kind of plays on the tropes that I love in my favorite way, I guess. Woman in Cabin 10 remains her masterclass, but I think one by one, I think it's going to do very well because you can see Ruth Ware's evolution as a thriller writer. It is probably the closest to the Woman in Cabin 10 to being expertly executed and have wide mainstream appeal. It would make an excellent movie. I mean, they all would. And it's interesting to see her moving away from what I call her gothic period, her two gothics, the death of Mrs. Westway and the turn of the key. I'm both excited to see her move away from the gothics and also sad because I thought they were really, really good. But essentially, I think One by One is going to really satisfy Ware fans who liked her earlier books. It's the Hitchcockian, Christie-esque, high concept thrillers. And it's a really good one. That said, it's been a long time since you've seen me do a spoiler talk in a wrap up video. And I honestly really wanna talk about this one in a spoilery way. I do have feelings about the spoilers. So I'm going to do a brief little spoiler section. 
As always, it's gonna be down on the screen, and I will have timestamps down below so you can skip ahead of this. The thing is, this book doesn't come out until September, so if you're watching this, you either do not care about spoilers and you just want to know everything that goes on in the book, or you're gonna come back to this later and watch it after you've read the book. But this is one where I just gotta get my feelings out. I also put these spoilery thoughts in my Goodreads review under a spoiler tag, because I had to get them out. Okay, so spoilers, spoilers, it's big. It'll literally ruin the book if you if you watch this part. Okay, spoilers. So it turns out Liz is the killer because Liz is a sociopath. So this is one of those tropes you know I love if you watch those videos where it's not only secret sociopath, but it's POV sociopath, which also means it's got POV narrative trickery in it, which I love when it's well executed. And I'll say it was very well executed in this book. I did start to cop to it a little before the halfway point, and I'm proud of myself for that. But I honestly see a lot of readers not copping to it until it really hits them in the face because it, it is well done. Once I started suspecting it and looking for it, I noticed how clever Ware was in how she wrote Liz's chapters and her POV. Very, very well done. That said, I, I guess my spoilery feelings, they're kind of twofold. In the end, Liz is an excellent sociopath character. Like the third act where you know that she's the bad guy, like she does the turn at around 70%. And I actually thought for a second, oh, maybe I'm wrong. It feels too early to reveal the bad guy. But she did the style of it where you find out early and then it's an extended third act with a lot of like escalating tension with the bad guy, which was done really, really well. I was definitely tense. I wasn't sure how Aaron was going to get out of it and has a very exciting chase at the end and gruesome death scene that I thought was very well done. But here's here are my spoilery feelings. I'm very conflicted about this because as well done as it was, I'm also kind of like, I was so I tried to be careful on how I talked about it in the non spoilery section, because I didn't want to reveal it. I mentioned that Liz is a very typical wear anxious heroine. And in that respect, I found her really relatable in the same way that I find every Ruth Ware heroine relatable. And I have to say, Ruth Ware is allowed to deconstruct her own character archetypes. I actually find it interesting that she's pushing herself in that direction. But where I feel a little unsure in terms of the execution. And I almost have to reread the book to see if it was me projecting onto the book or if my feelings are accurate. Who knows? I, I probably will need to reread it. I guess it's tough for me because I have been the Liz. I have been the kind of awkward, clumsy, overweight, not pretty person or not as pretty person at the young hip company with a lot of social outings from hell. Everyone was 22, 23, reliving high school at this job, young, hot, lots of hookups, lots of drama, and I hated it. Thus, I related to Liz. I related to her POV chapters because I was like, oh yeah, the characters from this startup are pretty insufferable. They're really full of themselves and like shallow. And man, team Liz. So meaning emotionally, it was an extra gut punch to me to have Liz turn out to actually be a sociopath, not be an, just an awkward put upon character. That's probably my own personal projections kind of informing how I feel. And I guess it's better to have feelings about something a book does than to have no feelings at all. But my second thing where I'm kind of scratching my head a little about the way that the sociopathy was developed and revealed or the personality disorder is how I'm going to put it. Ultimately, like she's pretty textbook. Before I kind of figured out that maybe Liz was the bad guy, I was trying to kind of pin her down as a character. Because as I mentioned, she is the most anxious, anxious Ruth Ware heroine that I had seen. She She's more extreme, meaning she's more socially awkward than even the most awkward Ware heroine. People are really mean to her. She prefers to be alone in her room. A lot of her thought process, you know, she thinks about not fitting in in school. And it's part of the sympathy, of course, that is later used against you. But she also describes what is essentially mirroring, which is trying to figure out what all the normal normal kids and the cool kids, like how to fit in with them and desperately trying to fit in with them. And once you know that she's the killer, you go, oh, Ruth Ware was basically 
doing a sociopath, but trying to pull a fast one on us by going, haha, you just thought she was socially awkward and bullied. No, she's a psychopath, which is a really interesting thing to do. But I guess it just made me slightly uncomfortable because when I see mirroring like that, I don't think of a sociopath, though it's so true. I guess I should say the ways that sociopaths mirror are different from the ways that non-sociopaths mirror. And I guess I was trying to give Liz the benefit of the doubt as a character, but it makes me feel uncomfortable because people who do that kind of mirroring are 99.9% .9 of the time outside of fiction, not psycho killers. I, I guess it just made me uncomfortable and it is a me thing, but it also made me uncomfortable because ultimately what this means is, I guess this is it, Liz is every bad part of a sociopath and she's every bad part of an awkward, anxious character. She's described as not particularly attractive, as having like a ill-fitting dress with fat rolls in it. She's not, she doesn't have social graces. She isn't charming. People don't really like her. She's good at order and like uh, doing her job. She was a personal assistant. But to me thus, it feels like Liz as the bad guy character gets every bad aspect of a, of a sociopathic character and none of the good. And to that point, she almost, it feels off to me. The thing about mirroring is sociopaths are actually good at mirroring. Basically what the book wants you to take away is, oh, Liz was such the perfect killer and perfect sociopath because she hid, because she was unattractive and invisible and people ignored her because they didn't like her. That's actually not how the average sociopath hides. They usually hide by being charming and likable. At the same time, I guess it's like, Am I upset because it's a different interpretation? No, I guess I did relate to Liz on a certain level and I thought it was an interesting choice to have it be that the unattractive, awkward person is a psycho killer and like, oh no, but the beautiful characters. I, it just, it kind of sat with me the wrong way. But regardless, my feelings takeaway of it was I was kind of let down that it was the fat, unattractive, socially awkward character was just such a textbook nasty sociopath, all the bad stuff without any of kind of the interesting, I guess good stuff, we're gonna put that in quotation marks, and thus meaning she almost didn't feel like a whole and complete character. And I think that making those choices was about the sleight of hand of the twist and less about Liz feeling kind of accurate. Meaning if that's really what she was like, I have trouble believing that she hid as well as she did. I think that is my thing. I think it's also about the dichotomy. So I didn't really mention it, but Erin, it turns out is 22. First of all, she read more like 32. I was shocked when it at the very end, it's like, she's 22. I was like, she's what? But she's also young, so she's young and beautiful. And I think that's the other thing, the contrast. She is nice to Liz in the beginning, which Liz notes. But I think maybe Liz's character would have worked a little bit better if maybe Erin weren't a perfect, rich, pretty final girl against the uggo evil sociopath, if that makes sense. My feelings are a jumble. I probably said it better in my Goodreads review, but that's kind of the spoiler feelings I had. Nothing enough to dock a star, but enough that I don't think this can be my favorite Ruth Ware book, if that makes sense. I just kind of, that said, on a reread, I might decide that she's a genius and that she pulled it off perfectly and that I was projecting onto the character and that's not fair. I don't know. And spoilers. Sorry that went on so long. <laughs> so next, I read another morbid and depressing nonfiction book, but it was amazing. I read Trial by Fire by Scott James. This one is going to be coming out in the fall, and it is a nonfiction account of the Station Nightclub Fire that happened in West Warwick, Rhode Island in 2003. It is the single deadliest nightclub incident in U.S. history. A hundred people died and several hundred were maimed, burned, etc. It's really, really famous for a number of reasons, but essentially in 90 seconds from the start of the fireworks and fire to 90 seconds, it was over. People who didn't get out in 90 seconds died. It's horrific. It's really horrific. So obviously don't read this one if that sounds so horrific, you don't wanna read an entire book about it, but I did. I love real accounts of harrowing events, true crime, etc. And I especially love 
a really well-researched and beautifully written book by a talented narrative journalist, and that is what this is. Scott James was a local reporter at the time, also from Rhode Island. He knows this place, he knows these people, and he got incredible access to a ton of people who have never spoken on the record about this, including the nightclub owners, who I won't spoil what happened, you can Google it if you want, but like, I mean, things got really, really intense after the fire. Everyone was looking to find out why this happened, who to blame, and who would pay the price for a, such a high death toll. Like, oh God, when you hear the number of children who lost one or both parents, I mean, it's a knife in the heart. And the book goes in depth. Primarily it profiles three people. Two people who survived the fire and you follow their journey along the way. It also goes into the people that they lost. And one of the nightclub owners who was in the nightclub at the time. You also get a lot about his brother because they were, of course, co-owners. But you get this kind of portrait and it's these survivors who suffered and went through a lot and the club owner who suffered and went through a lot in a different way way. It goes in depth into the difference between the survivors and the victims, and you'd be amazed. It's fascinating to read. The families of the victims have all sorts of issues and would antagonize the survivors, and so meaning there was a ton of infighting among victims' families and survivors, fighting and shouting and blame. It is complicated. And because of the way that the fire was covered in the press at the time, it's also a really interesting examination of local media versus national bias in media, what bias means, the kind of race to get the story, and long-term impacts of poor reporting. I thought the, the book was both fair but also clear about how James, a journalist, feels about some of the things that happened during this whole ordeal. And I definitely felt reading the book that I was getting a fair, thorough accounting of as many facts and details as possible and analysis to have a pretty fair and even-handed idea of what happened and who is to blame. All in quotes because it's complicated and it, it's nuanced because humans and tragedy. Anyway, I loved it. Five stars. Like all good nonfiction, it took me more than a few days to read because I was flipping through pages. I wanted to read it, but it was dense and upsetting, and there was only so much I could take in a single reading session. But I wanted to go to bed early to return to this book. It was that kind of book. So if you're a fan of narrative nonfiction and stories of this type, I highly recommend it. It's going to be out in the fall and it is Trial by Fire by Scott James. And last but certainly not least, I read An Education in Ruin by Alexis Bass. As you know, I really loved her last book, Happily and Madly, which I read last year. This one is both kind of similar and pretty different. This one is a boarding school book. Very exciting. But it's not so much a thriller. I would say it's going to work for fans of why a contemporary romance with a pretty strong suspense thread. It's about Collins Pruitt, who is transferring to Rutherford for her senior year. It is an elite prep school in California where the children of the elite go, and you know from her perspective that she has an agenda, that she's going to the school for a very specific reason, and her targets are Theo and Jasper Mahoney. You don't completely know why, but you know that she's fixated on them, that Theo has a secret she needs to find out, and that Jasper, she needs him to fall in love with her. So the first kind of thread and thrust of the book is it's a little bit vague because Collins doesn't let us, the reader, know why she's doing these things. You just know that she's there for revenge and that these are her goals. So it's how she insinuates herself into Theo's friend group. It's how she tries to get Jasper to pay attention to her, but he's a very serious a student and he's getting over an ex-girlfriend so he's kind of resistant to her at first and I'll say that the book really kicked off for me about the halfway point because they go to a shareholders meeting for a up-and-coming company which has to do with the plot and they go to this amazing ski chalet I think ski chalets are a theme for this reading wrap-up where it's just like 
ridiculous lifestyles of the rich and famous and it's also where the romance clicks into place and from that point I was really hooked on the romance and the kind of trappings of richness like it's there in the early part of the boarding school but it actually isn't until you leave school and essentially that's over the Christmas holidays into New Year's and you're at this swanky resort that I really like clicked into it and in Happily and Madly it's it's when the main character really started going to the rich people's home where I was like yes so I like all the the rich stuff. And there is suspense. You do find out why Collins is doing what she's doing, of course, because this is romantic suspense of things change and regrets happen, but she has to carry through with her plan, right? And there's things with tech companies and fraud and like people with money on the line and families being ruined. So it's that kind of romantic suspense. I'd say if you're one of my watchers who's like a hardcore thriller fan, I don't think this book is for high concept thriller fans. But if you are more of a YA contemporary person who loves romantic suspense, you might really like this one. And onward, friends, the reading stump is broken. I'm so excited having Go, burned through these books, finally. And I have more in store. So I'm gonna wrap up this reading wrap up, but you should get the next one more or less on schedule because I expect this to be a big reading summer. I'm also gonna do some special videos like summer thriller recommendations because there's so many big books coming out this summer that I read ages ago and they're easy to kind of forget. So you can look for more of that kind of bookish content. So give this video a thumbs up if you like it and I will make more bookish content. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and happy reading.